Um, my name is Christine O'Neill. I'm the chairman of Brodies, and I just want to welcome you all to the last, sadly, and fourth in our series of breakfast seminars, uh, which we've been hosting in partnership with Sunday Times Scotland on the topic of uh, Brexit. Uh, when we organised these sessions, uh, we didn't know exactly the date on which Article 50 would be triggered, but it happened to coincide with the first of our seminars, which was exceptional planning on our part. Um, we certainly didn't know that the general election that was not going to be called would be called halfway through um, this series, which has added a different kind of flavour to some of our discussions. What we did know is that the question of free movement and the rights and status of EU nationals in Scotland and the UK, and indeed UK nationals in the rest of the EU, was the single biggest issue that we had been asked about as legal advisers following the referendum result last June. So we knew this would be a very popular event. Um, thank you very much to all of you for coming. Um, I also should say we didn't appreciate how popular our live streaming of these events would be. And if you haven't been to any of the previous sessions, I should warn you um, that your questions are being streamed live to um, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter and will be available after the event to be replayed at your leisure. Uh, I am going to hand over in a moment to Gillian Bowditch, who uh, will introduce the panel for this morning. Um, we're very grateful to have Gillian chairing this event. Um, she is a columnist and feature writer who has worked in London and Scotland for The Times and The Sunday Times. Um, her interview uh, subjects uh, are as diverse as the Dalai Lama to Lulu. So I suspect she's capable of keeping control of this morning's uh, proceedings. Um, as I say, we're very grateful to her for chairing the event and I'll hand over to Gillian now. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, um, for uh, coming out this morning. Um, and thank you to our panel as well um, to, for, for coming to this debate on uh, Brexit, the movement of people and bridging the skills gap. Um, on behalf of the Sunday Times, on behalf of Brodie's LLP, I'd just like to welcome you and also say thank you to Brodie's for keeping us topped up with coffee and bacon rolls while we decide whether we'd like our Brexit hard, soft, continental or full English. Um, as I say, the, as Christine has already said, this is the final debate. If the others are anything to go by, we're expecting a lively, good-natured and stimulating session this morning. Um, We've got a stellar panel for you. We're going to hear a, a short summation um, from each of them of what they see as the, the key issues before taking questions from the floor. And um, I think we should have some microphones, is that right? So if you could wait till the microphone gets to you before speaking, that would be great. If you could keep it relatively concise, that would also be very helpful. We will finish on time because uh, at least one of our panel has a, a plane to catch this morning. Um, so, in the spirit of breakfast, Brexit and brevity, I will now introduce our panel. Um, we have um, uh, on, my, um, on my right, uh, Professor Antoine Muscatelli, Principal and Vice-Chancellor of Glasgow University. Uh, Antoine was born in Italy, spent his formative years in Holland and uh, was educated in Scotland. And um, he's heard of, held a variety of academic management positions at the University of Glasgow en route to leading it, including Daniel Jack, Professor of Political Economy. He's also been Principal and Vice-Chancellor at Heriot Watt University, and he's been in the past a consultant to the, Wor the World Bank, the European Commission, and he has uh, advised government both north and south of the border in um, a variety of, um, of roles. Next to him, Dr. Peter Benny is chairman of the British Medical Association in Scotland, a graduate of Glasgow University's medical school. His specialism is psychiatry, and he practices general adult psychiatry in Paisley. He first got involved in medical politics as a student, trying to safeguard training posts in the west of Scotland. And 30 years later, he is still deeply concerned about the recruitment and retention of clinicians. In January, Dr. Benny told the BBC that the NHS is stretched to breaking point and that staff shortages could lead to system breakdown. 
Next to him, we have Dr. Kirsty Hughes. Uh, Kirsty is the uh, foremost Scottish thinker, writer, and commentator on matters European. She is the founder and director of the Scottish Centre on European Relations. And she was also a senior political advisor in the European Commission. kirsty has been head of advocacy for Oxfam, and she's been the chief executive, uh, chief executive officer at the Index on Censorship. And if you're looking for a clear, concise summation of the big Brexit questions, I can thoroughly recommend her uh, latest commentary on the uh, Scottish Centre of European Relations website. Um, and at the end of the table, we have Tom Harris. Tom is a former Labour MP and UK Government Minister in the Department of Transport. He uh, stood for the leadership of the Scottish Labour Party six years ago. So that's three leadership contests ago, not the last one, not the one before that, but the one before that. So, um, in 2016, he became Scottish Campaign Director for Vote Leave. He's a journalist, a commentator, and a leading member of the Twitterati, and a very witty thorn in the side of Jeremy Corbyn. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Kirsty if she will um, kick off this morning, and then uh, Anton's going to talk to us, then oh. Peter, and then Tom. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out so early to discuss these issues. Um, we've, we've been asked to just give some very, very brief introductory comments, so, it's, so I shall do just that, just a few kind of headlines. Um, as, as we know, the UK intends to set its own migration policy after Brexit. It's up there with not being under the European Court of Justice. It's, it's one of the top two Theresa May red lines, I would say. Um, equally in return, we, we know that the EU 27, pretty much top red line, apart from rights of EU citizens already in the UK, is the four freedoms of the single market, and, and it's been said again and again and again that you cannot have the same sort of access and membership of the single market you have now if, if you aren't um, respecting those four freedoms. Um, so, so that's the broader context. I, I actually wanted to start with one point, that tur turning this round a bit, so rather than talking about uh, what's going to happen to immigration into the UK, what about the other question that we don't seem to be talking about so much, which is what will happen to our rights <coughs> to visit or work or stay in the EU 27? And that, the simple answer is we don't know so far. Is the government going to negotiate on this? Is, is it, um, is, if it's going to negotiate, is that going to be a negotiation about the UK's migration policy? So are we going to take back control, set our own migration policy, but actually then turn around and negotiate it with the EU 27. Um, we know from last summer, um, unrelated to Brexit, but the European Commission is proposing a whole new um, prior, prior access system for under 90 day visa free travel called ETIAS, the European Travel Information and Authorization System. Uh, that's going to be you know, a minor hurdle for us, perhaps, if that's the system we have to use to get over to go in, in future to the rest of the EU, but I think the really interesting question is what about the longer stays? What about the over 90 day stays? What about the rights um, to, to live and work? The, the only countries that don't need visas for longer stays in the EU are the European Economic Area, including the EU and Switzerland. So, so I think um, that's quite a big issue. And if the UK is going to have some sort of work permit system, then we presumably are going to face that on the other side. And of course, another issue in that um, is, is that the EU's migration policy is a so-called mixed competence. Each member state can determine the volume, the number of people coming, the crucial question, but the general conditions of how the EU 27 deal with third country nationals, um, there is quite a wide range of EU competences on that as well. My, se my second main point was to then try and link this question of where is migration going to come in the negotiations? Is it going to be in the negotiations to, to the crucial question of what sort of trade deal we do? And we've already mentioned soft, hard, in between, continental. Um, I'd kind of tended to imagine in, in writing about this and thinking about this that, that 
assuming or if we don't go off the WTO cliff because we have no trade deal, we're either going to have a relatively hard trade deal like the one that Canada has, that's hard compared to what we have now, or is there a spectrum? Could we end up with something quite close to the bespoke Swiss deal? Not quite as good, maybe, because they have free movement and we're saying we won't have free movement, but could we end up quite close? M might the EU give us a reasonably good deal? But remembering, of course, that even Switzerland doesn't have uh, the, the financial services access that we have, we have today. Um, what, I, what quite intrigued me in, in uh, reading a couple of things uh, ahead of today's ev event was uh, something that Jonathan Porters wrote, who's the, one of the, if not the leading UK voice and research authority professor at King's, um, on this. And I just wanted to quote it because I thought it was quite neat and it was opposite to the way I've been thinking about it. And he said, some on the UK side have been laboring under the delusion that other EU member states want access for their citizens to the UK labor market and that we can somehow trade such access for concessions on other issues, especially tariffs and regulations. This may be a profound misreading, he says. So I think if you look at, for instance, the House of Commons Brexit Committee, if you look at some of the House of Lords reports, there's a whole range of discussions there about types of systems, how to discuss this with the EU, and then you've got an EU expert, um, uh, sorry, a migration expert like Jonathan Porter is saying this, this may not be the politics of it at all. So, so I think how this is going to be handled, where we're going on it, what the EU side of it looks like is all for the moment completely wide open and really quite uncertain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Imagine. Well, thank you very much, Julian. <coughs> it's a pleasure to be here um, um, this morning with you. I was going to just restrict myself to, to four uh, points. I mean, the first is the issue of the needs of the Scottish economy in terms of inward migration and particularly <coughs> from, from the EU. Um, I think sometimes we forget, and partly because the population in Scotland is not only stabilised but has begun to increase again, that actually for years this was one of our biggest economic preoccupation, how we would deal with, with uh, demographic climate, particularly in terms of skills shortages. And, and we're now in a situation where we don't have a huge percentage of the Scottish population that is from uh, non-UK EU nationals. It's about 181,000. But what's important is that 115,000 of these are actually young migrants. Their employment rate is higher than that of, of, of UK nationals. And this influx has actually been a big contributory factor in stabilizing uh, the Scottish uh, uh, demographic decline. Not only that, but I think people often forget that we've now entered a, a different uh, fiscal regime within the UK in terms of fiscal framework. This is how resources are allocated from Westminster to Scotland, which means that our ta growing our tax base relative to the rest of the UK will be key to determining this, the Scottish block grant in terms of fiscal spending and determining public services. And actually, unless we are able to grow that, we will be actually in, in some economic difficulty. So that's, that's one point. The other point, which I have to say I found really quite disturbing about some of the discussions certainly leading up to the referendum, and it hasn't really been reversed since, is this, is this notion that I think people, um, as Kirsty said, link the leave vote to the immigration concerns. The data, in fact, if you look at any sort of economic data analyzing the effect that immigration is having on living standards in the UK, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that immigration, or indeed EU immigration, had any impact on, on average wages. There's absolutely no doubt, I think, in my mind, that the Leave vote was influenced by the fact that average incomes have not grown in the UK since 2007. That's a key fact. It's also a key fact in many other jurisdictions where there's been a move towards a, a, a populist uh, um, um, political stance. But I think if you Look beyond that data around re average incomes, that has not been caused. There's no causal link to immigration. And I think it's important to say this because I think we could get ourselves into a really negative rhetoric as, we, as Brexit is implemented, where we start saying all our problems are to do with immigration. The UK has full employment, pretty much. And actually, that supply of labor, both EU and non-EU, is a huge source of, of economic wealth. If you look at London, for instance, not just a, and this is my third point, it's not just about economies like Scotland. London um, has a huge reliance on, on immigrant workers in high skill sectors as well as low skill sectors. Um, I think there's around 682,000 workers from the EU in London at the moment. 
13% of the total workforce. Um, 1.3 million workers in London were bo born elsewhere in the world, up about a million from 2005. And a huge proportion of, the lo of London's gross value added is dependent on, on, on immigrant uh, workers. So how you reconcile that with trying to grow the economy post-Brexit, I think, is a real, a real issue. And I don't think we've confronted how we deal with that. Um, and within that, of course, I should mention higher education is hugely important. My own university has 850 uh, non-UK EU nationals who play an absolutely fundamental role in bringing income uh, to, uh, to the UK uh, through the grants that they capture from not only from the EU but from, from, from around the world. Um, I suppose my final point is, is referring again to the point that Kirsty made, which is around what is the post-Brexit uh, immigration regime that we have. And I think it's a bureaucratic nightmare. I don't think people have got their head around the fact that to move from where we currently are, where we have a UK that doesn't have um, either a population register or a residency register, to a situation where we have a regulated post-Brexit EU regime like the one that's in place for non-EU workers, is something that isn't easily attainable. And, and it's going to take many, many years to put in place a bureaucratic nightmare which could actually put off people from coming. And actually, I agree with Jonathan Portis Christie. Mm -hmm. I think uh, where EU 27 countries are particularly exercised is, is actually maintaining the rights for, their, for, for existing EU nationals. Quite rightly, you know, they want to defend their EU nationals. It's not that they want to export more labor to the, to the UK. I don't think there's any evidence. So <coughs> to see that as a trade off in some way uh, for, uh, for, for trade, I, I think that's, uh, that's unlikely. I think what the EU27 are going to try and push for is the four freedoms as part of a continued unfettered access to the single market. But I'll stop there because I think these are some of the key themes around immigration skills, and I do think we face some real, uh, real difficulties in ensuring that we can uh, access not only high skills but actually indeed intermediate and low skills as well given the full employment nature of the UK labour market. Thank you very much. Dr. Benny. Thank you. Good morning, folks. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll, I'll crack on because time's already going by. And yes, it's me that needs to catch the <laughs> flight. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very strongly of the opinion that we're now at a stage where it's imperative to have to be starting to find ways to make Brexit work rather than spending even more time, as many of us have over the last few months, pointing out all of the difficulties, almost in a, a kind of grieving process, I think many people have been. That's not going to help at this point. Within the BMA, you would expect us to be focusing on doctors, and, and we do. Um, as far as we can tell, there are roughly 10,000 EU doctors in the UK, roughly a little less than 1,000 in Scotland. And the reason those figures are rough is, is exactly as, as Anton was just saying. No one actually measures whether doctors come from the EU or not. Those figures are based on the medical school that people graduated from, and that often is not an indicator of what someone's nationality is. Um, I think it is important to say, and we've been saying this ever since the, the Brexit vote, these are valued colleagues and friends. Many of them have been here for up to 30 years. They're absolutely built into Scottish and UK society, and our health service could not function without them. And as we sit here just now, all of those friends and colleagues still do not know the first thing about what their rights will be as and when Brexit goes ahead. And really, if there's one thing more than anything else that my, my colleagues need, it is a clear statement from the UK government as to what is going to be their rights after Brexit. You may have seen reported in the press a BMA survey from a couple of months ago, the headline figure of which was that 42% of our members from the EU are now considering leaving the UK. Who knows how that plays out in the real world, but it's a very disturbing figure. We certainly couldn't sustain anything like that kind of exit uh, from the medical staffing within the UK, um, and it can't be allowed to happen. And then there's the question that follows on from that about future migration into the UK by EU doctors, because um, round about the time of Brexit, particularly at the, the Conservative Party conference last October, there was, there was quite a lot of talk of the, the solution to this issue being that we will we'll train up 
more doctors so that the UK becomes self-sufficient. Not in itself a bad idea, but quite evidently simplistic when it takes a minimum of 10 years from starting in medical school to qualifying and being able to practice as a medical specialist. What on earth do we do within those 10 years if we can't continue to allow and encourage EU doctors to migrate into the UK to help run our health service? Um, in terms of the specific BMA priorities, which we are doing our best to, to push during this election, which is about Brexit, um, those are to give highly skilled EU doctors and researchers who are currently in the UK unambiguous reassurance about their continued right to live and work here, to deliver a flexible immigration system which would enable doctors and researchers from the EU to work in the UK and for UK trained doctors to continue to practice in the EU. We don't know the numbers, we think they're smaller and we think they're being badly missed out of this whole debate and I was, I was very pleased to hear discussion of them earlier. We also want to preserve as much as we can of the current existing reciprocal arrangements which are there to protect patient safety and that must, from our perspective, include the current situation where there's mutual recognition of professional qualifications across the EU, certainly for doctors. And we also want to do what we can to secure ongoing access to EU research programmes and research funding. Our universities and our medical academics are absolutely dependent on this funding and at present we're already seeing that start to, to leach away. Um, finally, we also are very keen to ensure that the safeguards for doctors in the UK provided by the working time regulations, originally European but now within UK law, we don't know where they're going to be once the Great Repeal Act has finally finished and we want to ensure them. If you boil that down to its essence, we basically are very determined that Brexit can't be allowed to threaten the medical profession or the patients that we serve. Having said that, we see the way ahead on this is to be forming alliances, to be lobbying, to be working with anyone who can help our cause. And we do have the advantage within the BMA of very strong relationships with our sister organisations across Europe which is allowing us already to be lobbying both in EU organisations and via our sister organisations with individual European governments. Because Brexit is a two-way negotiation. You'd expect us to be talking to UK government as best we can and to be talking to the national governments, and we are. But we're also doing everything we can to influence that negotiation from the other side because any negotiation has to be about win-win rather than the, the danger that we're in just now of it not being so much a negotiation as a face-off. So I guess, I guess my basic message is let's move on from the vote last year, from Article 50. Let's accept where we are and get the best possible outcome from it. Thanks very much indeed. Tom Harris. <clears throat> Thank you, Gillian. Um, it was a, a relief in some extent to hear Peter saying that as a Remain voter, he wants now to kind of draw a line under the campaign at last and start talking about how we make Brexit work. During the campaign last year, I very stupidly, naively uh, suggested that whatever the outcome on June 23rd, uh, I was absolutely confident that, that as a nation, as a UK, we would all swing behind whatever the result was and make sure it worked. Uh, that hasn't happened. Um, I think it's important that it does happen um, it's, it's interesting, and if you don't mind, I'll give a political uh, context rather than, th th than some of the, the sectoral uh, expertise we have in the panel. It's interesting that in this general election, we have a Conservative government heading for a very, very large majority uh, with a fairly unambiguous agenda in terms of Brexit. We have a main opposition party that's about to become you know, significantly less main uh, which doesn't really seem to have a distinctive approach to Brexit at all. We have a leader of the opposition who, ostensibly leading the campaign to remain last year, went on a talk show on a Friday night and said that his support for the EU was limited to 7.5 out of 10. Um, and, and, now he's, and, and then he whipped his MPs to vote for Article 50. And interestingly, the only unambiguously pro-EU party, the only party that's demanding another referendum, that wants to halt Brexit in its tracks... <coughs> the Liberal Democrats, has actually gone down in the polls since the start of the, of the general election. Uh, I think it is a very sensible, sensible position for Remainers to take 
that to get involved in the process, start arguing for what's important to them, whether that's an industry or whether it's a, a political opinion. Um, of course, I mean, uh, Anton is, is right that, that immigration played a very large part in the, in the referendum. I don't think it played quite as big a part up here as it did in the, at a UK level. Um, there is, I think, and I argued this during the campaign, there is a view that talking about taking back control over immigration would mean draw, you know, pulling up the drawbridge. It was never intended, certainly from my point of view, to be such. It was always about giving UK politicians the right to decide immigration policy, uh, whether that would be a more open immigration policy or whether it was a closed policy. And the important thing for me as a former politician was that those decisions had to be accountable to the British people, the, the people who were playing host to uh, immigrant communities, and that was, and, and there was a political and democratic uh, accountability there that I think that those of us involved and who are batting for a particular sector must acknowledge that the people in this country do have a right to have a say on immigration policy. And what's really interesting, uh, just listening to the contributions this morning, is that we are about to move for the first time in a very long time into a debate not about EU immigration and non-EU immigration, but a debate about immigration. Because after Brexit, it's just a question of whether we allow people who are not from this country to come and live and work in this country, whether they're from the EU or whether they're from uh, outside the EU. And during the debate last year, I did find a certain, um, well, an inevitable uh, bias, if you like, towards EU citizens, of course, because we were part of the EU. But there is clearly a, a level of unfairness towards non-EU citizens with just as many skills to offer our economy and our communities who, because they are not from the EU, are having to try very, very much harder to get into the country to give us, to share those skills and expertise with us. Um, that's about to be swept away. We are about to see a level playing field introduced into immigration for the first time. And there is a positive aspect to that. Um, just one last thing is the whole of my life I have heard politicians of, of my party and other parties talk about the importance of training. We hear about the parity of esteem of apprenticeships with degrees. We hear about Tony Blair's commitment to get 50% of school leavers into further and higher education. Um, we hear about uh, the hospitality industry, for instance, complaining that British and, and Scottish uh, school leavers don't have the communication skills to go into the hospitality industry. And it's all been talk. It's all been headline grabbing and it's been aimed at press releases. And for the first time, our politicians are living in an environment where there is at least a possibility that if we don't train up Scottish youngsters to fulfil those roles, we may not be able to rely on an unending supply of foreign workers to do those jobs for us. And it puts a huge amount of pressure on politicians. And it's something we should welcome, that for the first time in our generation, these politicians are actually going to have to put the money where their mouth is and actually deliver on training of uh, the indigenous population. They have been allowed to ignore that for too long because they've always been aware the safety net of EU immigration has been there. Now, having said that, we don't know what the agenda of the government is. I expect we'll see it very quickly after June the 8th. I have absolutely no doubt that the, the, uh, the status of EU, uh, EU citizens living here will be sorted very, very quickly. There is absolute consensus across the parties that it will be protected, and hopefully that will be the same for UK citizens living in the EU. Um, I think we're going to have a very difficult negotiation time. And I think, as with all EU negotiations, they'll be incredibly difficult, 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 difficult until the last week, and then we'll get a deal. Uh, but I don't know what the shape of that deal will be, but I do think it will be incredibly helpful for those, even those who feel very strongly for Remain, to get behind the move to Brexit and argue their own corner. Thanks very much indeed. Um, well, we've heard some very interesting contributions there. Um, just to throw a couple of numbers into the mix before we throw open to the floor, we have very recently had the, um, the statistics from the General Register of Scotland, and um, we know, for example, that uh, last year, or the, the, the year, the last year, there were figures for 22,900 um, 
overseas migrants, um, uh, that was the net gain uh, for Scotland in, in uh, migration, and it was mainly from overseas. So um, although more people come from England to Scotland, more Scots go to England. So we, we, we do seem to be very dependent on um, uh, overseas migration, and um, a lot of that is obviously European. We know, for example, that uh, currently there are about 58 dependents for every 100 taxpayers in Scotland. Um, even without Brexit negotiations, the forecast is for 67 dependents for every 100 workers in 25 years' time. So just before we throw over to the, the, the floor, I mean, Tom, how optimistic are you that, that we can bridge the skills gap if we do end up having a negotiation which um, is more restrictive of, um, of people coming into this country? I know it's not everyone's priority, but I, I, I genuinely think that the chances of forcing politicians and parties into a position where they're serious about it are greater now than they were in the past because they don't have that safety net. It's not going to be the, the, the silver bullet that, that helps every industry uh, faced with a, you know, a, a serious skills gap uh, and a skills shortage. Um, but nevertheless, it's something that has to be addressed, and I just did not see any prospect of it being addressed while they were able to just turn on that tap and, and know that there was always going to be a very, very healthy supply of, of EU workers uh, rather than training up uh, young, young people here. Mm. Anton, training up young people here, is that the answer? Well, it, <coughs> of course, well, one always wants to do that, and, and, and there's... Uh, as Peter said as well, I mean, in the case of, of doctors, they would be very welcome if there was a, an attempt to, to train medical professionals uh, from, from the home population. Uh, to replace 10,000 at UK level is going to require not only 10 years, but actually a huge amount of resource as well. So to do it without, you know, to, uh, to, to do it, to think that that will substitute for EU immigration, I think, is, uh, is a chimera. Um, I think the, the other point I'd like to make is that and perhaps it didn't come through as much in my, my remarks at the beginning. The UK is a, has an interesting regional structure in terms of its economy. Um, and, you know, I've talked about London, I've talked about Scotland, I've talked about different sectors. You know, taking the same approach that we currently take to non-EU immigration, I think is wrong. I think we need both a sectoral and a regional differentiated approach, potentially, because I think the gaps will be very different. Gaps are huge in the NHS. Mm. They're absolutely huge in some sectors like you know, higher education, financial services, there may be less in other sectors, but, but it's a huge task to put that post-Brexit structure in place. But I certainly a differentiated approach by nation, region, and sectorally, I think might be the sensible way to go. Excellent. Questions from the floor, who, who would um, like to address the panel? L lady uh, in the middle there with the glasses. So could you just wait for the microphone? That's uh, just that down here. Thank you. My name's Karen Friel, and I'm... Although we're talking about emigration, there's a flip side to the same discussion, and that's emigration, i.e. people leaving Scotland. Although that's likely to plateau over the next few years because they may not have perceived freedom of movement within the EU, that is also part of an immigration discussion. Do the panel have any ideas on how to keep talented people in this country. Peter Benny, do you want to um, answer that? <coughs> yes, although I'll, I'll start by answering almost the, the, the opposite question, the, the, the premise that we're, we're starting to grapple with here, that it's a desirable thing that all of our sectors should eventually be self-sufficient, which means populated entirely by people who live and train in the UK and are originally from the UK. I'm sorry, but that's not the society that I'm looking for at all, and it's certainly not what I'm looking for for doctors. We want to be able to continue to recruit the brightest and best to the health service and to academic medicine from across the world. We don't want to be saying, you can only work in the NHS in the UK or in UK universities or UK research facilities if you have a UK passport or you were born here or whatever. I also have quite a bit of anxiety about the idea that it's really important that we must stop or reduce emigration by 
UK citizens. Um, because, of course, there's plenty of ways that you can try to do that by being restrictive. And I don't think that helps, again, when you're dealing with, with doctors who are amongst the, the brightest and the best. As, as some of you may know, at present, only half of the doctors who in the UK who complete the first two years of training in hospitals, which are effectively mandatory, only half of them go straight into training in the UK. And many of them step out of UK training either to take time out altogether or to work in other countries across the world. And the, the vast majority of that is not within the EU, despite freedom of movement. The vast majority of that is actually in Australia and New Zealand. Most of those doctors come back to us, and they come back to us better doctors. So I, I don't want to be thinking in terms of constraining the ability to leave the country. I want to be thinking in terms of making our country, in each of its sectors, the best place to work. Christy, you, you brought up the subject of um, uh, immigration uh, as well as inward migration, um, and, and it's a two-way street. I mean, how do you see um, this shaping out? How, how big a role will Yes, I mean, I, I think my, well, my answer to the question would, would be I don't think we should be trying to stop them. Um, because if, if you want to, you know, young people will want to travel. The question is, how do you get them to come back again, not stopping them from, from going? And, and I think, you know, maybe one of the saddest things about what we're facing uh, with, with uh, Brexit is, is restrictions potentially on UK young people and Scottish young people traveling freely and working freely around the EU27 um, and, and vice versa. So I think that's, <coughs> I think that's one point. Um, a, a second point is I think skill is terribly important to our sort of advanced economy, but let's not leave low and medium skill out of this discussion, not least because at the moment the only immigration in terms of low and medium skill is coming from the EU27, and that's the way our immigration system is set up. So non-EU citizens at the moment have to have a, cer a certain level of skills, and the, the House of Commons Brexit Committee estimated if you applied those non-EU rules to EU, uh, that would cut out three quarters of current immigrants. And that may sound very high, but a Theresa May has said she wants to reduce current immigration to the tens of thousands. So, so I think we're looking at potentially a, a very damaging trajectory, and I don't think we, you know, there's absolutely nothing to say so far that it is going to be this level playing field, um, there may well be some EU positive preference given, but I, but I think the you know the total uh, numbers are, are potentially very economically damaging um, with the Tories sticking to that target. And, and I just say one thing about this kind of accepting Brexit swinging behind it. I, f I find that profoundly undemocratic. Yes, a decision has been taken. But if we think, as I think, that this decision is wrong, is economically damaging, yes, we're in the business of pointing out least worst and most worst, but, but I, th I think we have a responsibility as, as researchers and experts to tell the truth as we see it. In, in a democracy, it's not a question of swinging behind one party, one point of view, Team UK. I, I think that's a profoundly wrong way to have this debate. And if, if you looked at the, I thought the most extraordinary news story yesterday was a survey of supply chain managers across the EU, and it suggested 45% of companies were looking at switching supply chains from the UK to the EU27. If that survey is remotely correct, the sort of impact we're about to see of Brexit is, is going to be damaging even before we get to March 2019. Tom, do you want to come back very quickly on that? And then we'll take a question from the lady in the purple card cardigan in the third row. I just want to actually come to the aid of Karen, who asked the original question. I don't think there's any suggestion or question that she wanted there to be governments preventing people leaving the country. I think that's ra <coughs> rather the wrong way of, of putting it. The fact is, <coughs> Britain has never been a position where uh, the number of people who want to come to this country uh, <coughs> has been anything other than, you know, there's never been other than a strong demand, even before EU membership, even before freedom of movement. Britain has been one of those countries that people do want to come and live in. Now, the problem <coughs> of Scotland within that is that you know Scotland historically has seen a reduction in its in its population. 
I read an article once that suggested that was partly because of the climate. I'm not quite sure whether that's, that stands up. The fact is that, in, in, especially in times of recession, in the 1980s, both my older brothers and my younger sister both moved down to London. That was what happened, and it will, it will probably always happen in the UK that the, the centre has more jobs, even in hard times, and, and we're, going to have to, we're going to suffer that uh, skills drain, if you like, uh, of the country. The, you know, one of the things that attracts people to come and live in this country, and it's very rarely mentioned, and Jean-Claude Juncker is not a great fan of admitting this, but the fact is that we speak the English language, that, the, that English is the language of the internet, makes Britain a uniquely attractive place, and Ireland as well, uh, to come and live. And I just think we have to, you know, value the things that do make this country an attractive place for the world to come and live in. Okay, another question, please. Um, I would like to come back to the uh, remark from Professor Muscatelli on the uh, need for a regional and sectoral approach to immigration. Even if probably a lot of uh, experts would uh, agree with you, uh, do you think it's really, how likely is it that the uh, UK government will agree to that? Because we've seen before with the post-study work visa, for example, that they're not, don't seem to be keen on a uh, regional approach at least. Well, that's a, it's a, it's a very fair point. I, I mean, I, I certainly I haven't seen any evidence that they're, that they're uh, likely to be sympathetic to this. Uh, that doesn't mean that it is, as you say, it isn't. If it's right, we shouldn't continue to argue for a differentiated approach. Um, I, I do think um, it's something that we'll need to get our head around um, because I think Kirsty is absolutely right. I think at the moment the UK hasn't had to confront, certainly since we have been part of, uh, of uh, the European um, sort of free movement area, what, what we do around low and middle level skills. And, and, and the gaps, some of the figures are absolutely staggering. Uh, if you look at you know, some of those middle and low level skills, the, it would have a, a huge dislocating impact. I, I, I sort of gave a lecture about a, six weeks ago in which I, I sort of presented some data on, on where the, um, the sort of slowdown in UK GDP might come from, from a hard Brexit. And, and if you look at it, it's not, Trade is only part of the story, and it's an important part of the story because, as Kirsty said, some of the supply chain uh, effects could be absolutely damaging. But just as big as that effect from the from the lower labour supply, from from immigration, just as big as the productivity effect from not attracting very talented people, who then, when they come, actually make other things happen in terms. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 those dynamic effects. I think we 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 run the risk of, of ignoring. So I mean I. I think you're right. I think there isn't much, uh, uh, you know, it's not, they're not being very receptive at the moment, partly because, frankly, it's one of many issues. But I think we have to continue making the case because, again, as Kirsty said, as experts, I think we have the, the duty to point out where the flaws are in the, in the hard Brexit argument, that we are actually heading, my view, for a pretty catastrophic outcome unless we have a relatively soft Brexit. And I, I hate these epithets, but, you, you know, if you... If you look at that, I, I still think some sort of single market solution, at the very least as a transition, is frankly the best that we can, we, we, we can, we can hope for. Uh, because you're not going to get a, a negotiated free trade agreement in two years' time. It's complete fantasy. Um, the best you can hope for, I think, is some transitory deal which will hopefully mean freedom of movement in the short run, which will then give you the, pl the platform for a longer discussion, whether it's around the Swiss lines or... or, or, or <coughs> yet another model that's still to be invented around a strategic partnership. But I'm going to take another question from the floor, and then um, uh, we've got a, a question over here. Gentlemen on the, on the end, if we can get a microphone over this way. Thank you. Uh, Richard Curley, the Centre for Scottish Public Policy. I went to a speech that the First Minister gave last year on uh, uh, shortly after the uh, referendum vote. The pre-release of her text referred to the four freedoms and referred to the freedom of movement of labor. When she spoke, that came out as freedom of movement of people. Given that a key skill set in the European Union is pirouetting around words and phrases, <laughs> is there significance in those two different words? Christy, do you want to uh, ad address that one quickly? Uh, um, <laughs> I, well, I, 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 I 
wouldn't want to, to say what was it, what was in her mind, other than uh, I think it was accurate what she said, maybe rather than, than what was written, because the, the, the EU started off in, in 57 with free movement of labor, and of course the general notion of EU citizenship came up with the Maastricht Treaty um, from 1993, and, and, and is a wider one, but I, I think um, it's, it's, you know, with Brexit, it, at one level, it's no longer re relevant to talk about the ways you can limit and control free movement of, of labor, but I think that was often very misunderstood during the debate, and if you remember when Cameron came back with those various um, rather, rather small compromises. Um, I, you know, I, I accept to some extent what Tom said in terms of English language, attractiveness of UK, London, uh, you know, Scotland to Edinburgh, Glasgow in terms of universities and so on, but I just, this is moving on a bit from your question, I know, but you know, I just wonder what does it do to our, what is it doing already to our image in the rest of the EU? I mean, I talked to a young, very, very talented student in Edinburgh a couple of months ago from Luxembourg who said, well, she would have been trying to stay in the UK, but with Brexit, she she now won't. If you're going to let people come, but on a temporary basis, or come and not have the same access to benefits, or to bring family, or or whatever else, how how is that going to affect whether people with skills, you know, who have choice of other jobs, are they are they still going to come? Um, the House of Lords suggested at one of their committees that, that you could go for a fairly soft Brexit and, and have a free movement with with jobs as opposed to pure free movement of labor, let alone free movement of people. I think, uh, as, as we've said so far, how much that's going to impact on the, on the type of trade deal is, is one big open question. And, and the second question, maybe implicit in what you're saying, is is that what we want? Is, is, is it that we want people to come for our own needs? We're seeing this in a terribly kind mm -hmm. of UK-centric sort of way. Is that what we want? We think these people will still come. We want them to come as long as you know they don't make too many claims on us, they've got exactly the right skills, maybe they go away again. Or do we want free movement of people? We're European citizens. We welcome that idea of open borders. And you know, that's a huge issue. It's, it's all very well saying, accept it. And I, and I agree, a, a lot of people are, are accepting it, and it's the direction of travel. But we shouldn't forget the difference between young voters and older voters mm. in, their, in their views on pre Brexit and, and young people, whether it's Europe <laughs> or Africa or elsewhere, travel and work in other countries is mm. very important. Peter, do you want to make a little contribution here? I, sure. We, sure. we know that in some parts of the, the UK, Aberdeen, for example, it's difficult to get people to stay Highlands and Islands. I mean, is it feasible to, to welcome people over and then try to get them into one part of the country or one part well one kind what of I was going to say about that is that we do already have at least the bare bones of a, a skeleton of the ability to have different migration policies for different parts of the UK the there's a, a UK shortage occupation list, which includes a number of medical specialties where we, we simply don't have enough uh, home graduates to fill those places at present. That's updated every couple of years. And there's a separate and additional Scottish shortage occupation list, which includes additional specialties. And it, it seems to me that that works very smoothly already for non-EU, non-EEA citizens. And therefore, we're already in a position where we've got at least the, the bones of that kind of structure, and I think it could work. If I may, for, for one minute, if it's not been clear from what I've said already, I do want to distance myself from each of the other two panellists who are portraying me as saying, well, move on, it's all, it's all over. <laughs> what I'm saying is, the time, in my view, for simply saying again and again, Brexit is bad, has gone. We've said plenty of that from the BMA as well. We're now in the position where we have to get the best possible out of what's in front of us. And I'm not sure we achieve that if our main message is, this is all a bad idea and we shouldn't do it, because that way we struggle to have any influence on the UK side of the negotiations. I'm just going to ask um, Gordon McGuinness, um, who is the um, Skills Development Scotland Director for Industry and Enterprise. I mean, he, just very quickly, Gordon, you've been very involved in this. Could you um, give us your perspective on how industry is facing up to this idea of um, the need for differentiation and the, uh, what's happening in different sectors? Thank you. Uh, 
I think there's still a lot of un uncertainty, as, as the panel have, have indicated. So we do a lot of work with industry leadership groups and then areas like uh, hospitality and tourism, financial services. Mm. There is obviously concern there and, and employers are looking for more certainty to actually provide that to their, to their staff. There's areas like agriculture, which is highly seasonal as well. So if you look at the soft fruits and others in the past, going back to to previous uh, immigration policy, there were short-term visas for that type of work because the seasonality, rurality of it uh, has not been attractive for many uh, Scots to undertake that, that, that type of work. And I think people will need to start thinking around the structure of policies. There would be an agreement with the points that uh, Professor uh, Muscatelli made around regional variations. I think that will be required. The, the kind of UK policy just now just looks at a, you know, everything's lumped in together, it's one kind of gross number and it tends to be a rather scary number for politicians and something that's stratified and looking at skilled workers, medium skilled workers, students and then perhaps unskilled workers, I think uh, policy needs to be moving in that direction and, and reflect regional variations in the labour market as well. Thanks very much indeed. Can we fit in one quick question? We're, time is marching on. We've got a gentleman um, at the back there. Uh, sir, yes, if you could uh, take the microphone. Thanks. Hi, thanks. Um, it's really just a quick question on City of London, which is seen as the, the main driver of UK economy, financial services. Obviously, there's a lot of the larger corporations that are now decided to set up um, potentially places of employment in Europe because they're concerned about the Brexit effect. So if the city of London employs, within the financial services district, employs so many people, and then as a consequence of that, the, the related hospitality, leisure industry, et cetera, benefit from that spend, therefore they're employing more people. Mm. What's the panel's view on where they think this is likely to go um, once we have the actual uh, Brexit negotiation finalized? i.e. we've already got a lot of these businesses making moves to move to Europe mm. and it's likely that this trickle will get larger and larger, I think. Tom, do you want to have a, a very quick response um, to that? Yeah, uh, I, I take a slightly more optimistic view than you, sir. Um, I think the you know, City of London is a world financial centre, not a European one, and I think it will continue to be such after, after Brexit. Um, that's not to say that there will be some relocation by some companies, but the indications so far, I have to say, I think have disappointed some of the more strident Remain uh, campaigners uh, because there hasn't been initially this this huge uh, outflux, if you like, of, of resources to, to Europe. But we'll see, you know, some of the, the more pessimistic uh, predictions could happen. I, I, I just don't see London at any point losing its, its reputation as a world centre of excellence as far as financial trade is concerned. Okay, I think on that note, we're going to have to call it a day, I'm afraid. I'm going to hand back over to Christine to say a few words. I just want to say uh, thank you to the panellists. Thank you to the audience. I'm sorry we didn't have time for more questions, but um, feel free to uh, nobble anybody who's uh, hanging about later. Thanks so much. Julian, you'll all have to get into the queue behind me because I had to sit in my hands not to ask questions myself. Um, just very quick thank you to everyone who was involved in, in putting on this series of uh, sessions. Thank you particularly to Sunday Times Scotland and to um, the Sunday Times Scotland journalists who were good enough to chair these sessions. We think they've been a, a great success. Thank you very much to our events team here um, who've put in an enormous effort to get these off the ground. Thank you very much to our uh, technology team at the back who've managed to stream us with uh, success. Thank you very much again to our panellists this morning and to all the panellists who have been involved. And thank you very much for coming along and making these a success. Good morning. Thank you.